Hey guys, and welcome to another video. I'm going to be showing you how to set up a wireless connection with uh, Zywall USG 20W and hopefully explain a few things along the way. So, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to configuration, network, interface after you log in. So, let's go ahead and do that now. So I'm going to go over here to configuration and you notice I have interface selected. I'm going to come over here to WLAN which stands for Wireless Local Area Network. And then if you see here, I've already got two wireless LAN set up. Um, for this video, I'm got, we're going to go ahead and set up a third one. First thing I want you to do is hit show advanced settings. Okay, show advanced settings and now you can choose your protocol. It's 802.11 which means it's wireless and the X can be filled in with B, G, B and G, B, G and N or G and N. In this case uh, we look right here. I've chosen the bottom one. B is for older technology. You shouldn't uh, be using B by today's standards. You may be using G but most likely are using N. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave it on G and N. But yours might be different. Now the channel I choose, you notice I have from 1 to 11. Um, choose a channel without uh, much interference. Um, you can use a wireless analyzer, a, f a free wireless analyzer application for your computer called Insider. Or you can use an app for your smartphone to see what kind of wireless networks are out there and the channels that they are on. You want to try to stay about five channels away from your neighbor's channel. Okay, so I'll just leave it on channel six since no one's by me. So now let's talk about CDS and RTS threshold. Um, it stands for carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance which means nodes the wireless nodes on your network attempt to avoid collisions by transmitting only when the channel is sensed to be idle so the the request to send and clear to send frame is only sent if this threshold uh, for the individual um, packet size is bigger than 2,346 octets or bytes. So if it's bigger than 2,346 bytes, then they're gonna you're gonna go ahead and send the RTS CTS frame, um, like you see right here. Okay. Now, if you're using today's standard Ethernet um, network, you can actually only send a frame that is 1,500 bytes. So setting your threshold to 2346 essentially disables the CTS RTS threshold. Now, if you do um, decide that you want to use this threshold for the uh, clear to send R uh, re request to send clear to send um, transmission, just know that it's going to create overhead in your network, and it shouldn't be used unless you absolutely need it. The only times that you would really need it is if you have um, nodes on your network that are really far apart, that are um, on opposite sides of the wireless access point, that most likely cannot um, see each other's wireless traffic, but only the wireless traffic of the access point. In that case, you may have collisions when they both try to send their packets to the wireless access point um, at the same time. And if they're far enough away, then they're not going to know that the other node is sending. This is called the hidden node problem. And that's where the CTSRTS would come in handy. Um, but I recommend doing a ping operation after you adjust this level so that you're not affecting your throughput. Because in the end, it's all about your throughput not about collisions. So if your throughput is still okay even with those collisions then go ahead and leave that default. 
Now, of course, your output power is uh, the, how much, how far you want your signal to reach. Um, if you're just in a, an apartment, you may need to turn it down to 25%, maybe 50%. If you're in a bigger house, you may have to do 50% to 100%. And if you want to use your wireless access outside of your house, then you probably just want to leave it on 100%. Okay. So the QoS is quality of service. And the only one you have to choose from by default is the Wi Fi multimedia quality of service. And what that does is it separates wireless traffic based on protocol. So video and voice conferencing packets would get priority over web browsing and data link pro um, protocols. So this just kind of helps you not have any lag when you're doing maybe online gaming or video conferencing or streaming video. So. Otherwise, if you turn it to none, then uh, no traffic has any priority over other traffic, and which is fine for if it's just data that you're sending. But like I said, when you start getting to the video and audio streaming, uh, you run into problems. Okay, so let's talk about aggregation, MSDU. It's what it does is basically increases the throughput by sending two or more data frames in a single transmission. It groups several data frames into one large frame, and it allows higher throughput because, as you know from networking, every packet has to um, have header information, source destination, um, and so what we're doing is we're just adding more data uh, for every packet or frame that we send. So it increases the throughput. So we want to go ahead and leave that one as checked. Now this auto block acknowledgement, what that is, is it's, it's um, standard that started getting used in 802.11 and instead of sending an individual acknowledgement for every frame, multiple frames can be acknowledged together by using a single BA or block acknowledgement frame. Okay, it just reduces overhead. Um, and of course when you decrease overhead you increase throughput so we're gonna go ahead and leave that one checked so now we're ready to go ahead and uh, create a new connection so go ahead and hit the green add button and what you have here I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger is the the new connection screen so let's hit show advanced settings so we can talk about all the different options you're given okay now of course you want to check the enable interface button because you're setting this up okay we've already done this okay now you can go ahead and name or number your interface Okay. This will be number three in my sequence, so I'll just leave it three. You can add a description if you want. Now when you pick your zone, make sure you pick WLAN for wireless LAN. Okay. Now the SSID, um, it's up to you to decide what you want to name your wireless network. And the SSID stands for Service Set Identifier. Um, when you search for your wireless net network, that's the identifier that you're going to see. I've seen people put some pretty funny things here for the SSID, like if they uh, happen to be in an apartment complex, they will write something to their neighbors, um, like turn down your music or stop being so loud, things like that, take your trash out, uh, wash your car, stuff like that. Um, you just type that right here. I've also seen people ask uh, other people out on dates and stuff. Just you know, when they when they check the SSID broadcast and then they see a message, it's kind of clever. Okay, so we can actually hide this broadcast if we want to keep it hidden. Um, it it doesn't actually hide it. What it does is it just doesn't broadcast it. 
Um, so people can still, they know what they're doing, they can still search it out and find your SSID, but um, if you don't want it being broadcast for a casual user to just happen upon it, then you can go ahead and hide it. Now, when we block intro BSS traffic, um, your BSS is your basic service set. The basic service set includes all wireless devices on your network and it may or may not include an access point, such as if you're in an ad hoc environment. And when inter BSS traffic is enabled, then the wireless stations in the same BSS can communicate with each other. So when you block it, obviously you're disabling that communication. Okay, maximum associations. I like to reduce this number because I usually don't need that many associations to my access point. Now for your security type, I recommend using WPA PSK, I'm sorry, WPA2 PSK. What that stands for is Wi-Fi Protected Access Version 2, Pre-Shared Key. Your pre-shared key can be between 16 and 63 characters long. Okay, that's where you enter that right there. And I recommend leaving these um, on their defaults. Now, you can pick your IP address for your wireless access point. So what I have here is some, and you want to use a private IP address. Now these addresses are reserved for private use. So you can use the 10.0.0.0 .0 .0 to 10.255.255.255. You can use anything in here, anything within this range, or anything within this range. Okay. So go ahead and enter that in for your IP address. And you want to probably keep it a low number, maybe the first set in your pool. Um, for your subnet mask, um, I recommend just using a class A, B, or C. Um, I'm not going to get into subnetting in this video, so we'll just do a class C. Okay, those are your choices. Okay, so for the interface parameters, you want to look at um, egress means exit, ingress of course means coming in. Maximum transmission unit, um, Ethernet uses 1500 bytes. You want to leave that um, where it's at. You don't want to go any higher because you're going to have problems on the Ethernet network and you don't want to go, go any lower because you're going to decrease your throughput. Okay, so now the DHCP settings, let's go ahead and look at that. Um, you want to set this to DHCP server. So you are serving up IP addresses. And depending on what you chose for your IP, let's say I did the 10.25.25.1, then my pool would start at 2. And let's say I want 150 on my pool size, so I'll give, I'll be able to give out 150 addresses, starting with this address. Okay. Now for your first DNS option, I always recommend using Zywall. So when whenever there's a DNS request, it'll check the Zywall first before it goes any further. The second uh, DNS server, I usually choose my ISP. So now it's going one step further, and it's going to my ISP's router. If if it still can't find the, the DNS lookup, then what I do is I use a custom to find one. And if you look right here, I go ahead and use open DNS and the IP address is right here for open DNS. Okay, so we'll go ahead and type that in over here. If you have a Win server, this is where you'd enter that. Leave the default router. Uh, on whatever you named it, which is WLAN 1.3. Now for lease time, I recommend giving your IPs a lease time with an expiration. These will expire in three days. And the reason is because um, if you need a static 
IP address for a particular node. Instead of putting it in an infinite, go ahead and uh, make a static DHCP table by clicking Add, entering the IP address that you would like to give to the node or workstation, such as if you have a server, then you want to make sure it has the same IP address, because if you're port forwarding to um, a server or uh, even a workstation that has a server or software running on it, then you're going to want it to always point to the same server, to the same uh, node. So that's where you put in the IP address that you'd like, and then the MAC address of your wireless adapter that's on that server. Add a description if you want, and then you're done. I'm going to go ahead and remove that. Okay, so the last thing I want to quickly talk about is RIP. Now, RIP is the routing information protocol. It's for internal networks. Uh, if you're going to use it, use version 2. And this, um, give, and if you're going to use it, make sure you give all your routers the same subnet mask because RIP does not carry um, a dynamic subnet mask when it, when it um, trades routing information with other routers. Um, it has a 15 hop maximum so it's not good for big networks. Um, distant, it uses the distance vector algorithm of uh, which is considered the hops and it says that the least hops will determine the path regardless of throughput or anything else. Now the broadcast routing database is broadcast and updated every 30 seconds so that creates a lot of uh, collisions and traffic on your network and only use this if you are absolutely required to because this is an outdated um, protocol I suggest if you're going to use a routing protocol use OSPF oh, it's open shortest path first it's a link state algorithm which keeps track of the entire topology and it only updates changes or every 30 minutes whichever comes first better for small medium sized dynamic networks but it's not actually good for enterprise networks of 100 or more routers because all those link state updates do actually slow down uh, the network and the database gets filled up really fast so once you choose all of those go ahead and hit OK I can't hit OK because I've missed a few things up here but when you hit OK, it's going to create your network. And from this point on, you're ready to go. Anyway, guys, if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks for watching. And if this video helped, um, like it and subscribe. Thanks.